9. I have the first five verses here. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. I say then the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are the Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this Wonderful time in your word, this wonderful day, these great people, and the opportunity to speak your word to people who really are interested in it. I just pray that we stand fast the rest of our lives in this good warfare and this good fight, and everything we do just to redound to your glory. Amen. The word pertaineth in there means the property of, or the right or duty of, and I believe these verses are in the future because there is... Three, to, three ways we divide the Bible. Time past, ages to come. No, time past, but now, and ages to come. And one of the main reasons why I believe it's going to happen because God calls it his home. Well, he says, earth is my footstool. It's going to be the city of the great king, the city of the living God, the new Jerusalem, the holy city descending out of heaven. God's going to live here. So who would even think that these things aren't going to be done? People who don't rightly divide the word of truth. I want you to think of something. Think of a word. Conceive. I'm not talking about grandkids. I'm happy about that. But I want to conceptualize something. What human would ever come up with a thought to save mankind? Can I make my point? Who wrote the book? There was 40-some authors, but who really wrote it? It's God Almighty. Jeremiah, Proverbs 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. I have a, a relative, a, a, a nephew, nephew, and we've been going back and forth. We stopped now. We had to stop. I believe he's saved, but he can't stand the Bible. And um, he said he got scared into getting saved but he hates the Bible. And he's saying it's not relevant today. I go, what do you mean relevant? He says, well, that was written for people a long time ago. I said, when did you start the new day here? Maybe 100 years ago. I said, you're telling me that you don't think people 2,000 years ago are the same than they are today. He says, exactly. And this is what he's been learning and all, everything that goes along with that. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Since the council in Acts chapter 15, which ties into Galatians 2, that council at Jerusalem, the biggest crime or sin perpetrated against Christianity has been to repudiate, reject the dispensational truth clearly seen. Most people, many people think they're spiritual Israel or spiritual Jews. And there ain't no such thing. Nowhere. Do you truly understand what the spiritual Israel crowd does? They have supplanted, they have abdicated, they've abandoned the most important truth in the Bible, not to mention God's final words to mankind, which explains why God has delayed some of the promises he made to the nation of Israel. If you would, please go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. They negate the last 2,000 years of God's long-suffering and patience in the same manner that I'm going to read. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, 
And I took that word willingly, and I found a definition that means cheerfully and happy. For this they are very willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Hebrews 13, 18 says, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. These people are not living honestly. Honestly. Now, the place that we rent out in Indiana, it's called the Waterford Estates Lodge. Now, I've been going there, it's a little over eight years. We have a few people from that, that place. Wonderful group of people. We're, we're finally starting to get some new, new folks. Um, Sam Wilchers, Chuck's son, and his, and his bride come there. Now, he had to move to Indiana because he couldn't afford the taxes in Illinois. And, <laughs> and then who else? There's another couple coming from Barney, Barney Monroe's. And uh, so we have two younger people because, you know, I'm one of the youngest there, and I'm 68. So it's, you know, it goes up from there. So, and when you're this age, you know you need somebody younger. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, and 38. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, and 38. Paul says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. What is keeping that ages to come time period? What is keeping that from happening right now? Who's, remember the word let? Only he who letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. What is holding back that time period? We are what, what church? Church of the body of Christ. We're holding that time period back. And again, these Israelite people that think they want to be Jews, they're denying the last 2,000 years of God's suffering, not willing that any should perish, but come to the knowledge of the truth, which is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. They take that and they throw it out the window because they want the spotlight on them. I was telling you about the church we're going to. We were going there eight, eight years. Um, the, the, there was a, a room built off the building some time back. It was supposed to be for a comedy club. So eight years ago, I told Rick it used to be a comedy club, and he said a lot of things that tried to embarrass me. But anyway, it's still going good. But we have a, we have a charismatic preacher at the other end now, about the last six months. He called me up, and I give him credit for that. He never met him. He wanted to introduce himself. And I asked him some questions about salvation. I said, do you know if somebody can lose their salvation, or can you? He said, well, I'm not too sure about that. And I asked him a bunch of other questions. He let me do it. And... That's what's going on. So we have a Pentecostal charismatic church down at the other end of the building, and then we're at this end, end of the building. You know, the Palestinian covenant, if you go to Genesis chapter 17, Genesis 17, and they get Genesis chapter 22 also. Genesis 17, Genesis 22. Genesis 17, verse 8. Now, this was written, written somewhere in the vicinity of 1911 B.C., if Usher's dating is correct. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. This is God talking to man. Is this spiritual or is this physical? It's physical. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us so. Genesis 17, 22, I'm sorry, 22, 17. Then in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. And, of, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Now, you know what book in the Bible in the New Testament quotes this? It's Hebrews chapter 6. 
And if you date it, Hebrews chapter 6 is 64 AD, and Genesis 17 was 1911 BC, you have 1,975 years later that the person who wrote Hebrews was quoting that verse. Almost 2,000 years. But when they quote Hebrews, they leave out half that verse. What part do they leave out? And thy seed shall possess the gate of his, of his enemies. How come that was left out? Does Israel possess the gate of their enemies? Is Israel in a headship position or not? Wasn't that diadem taken away from them? Because of what? Because of why? Anybody who thinks we're spiritual Israel or who wants to be a spiritual Jew, who want to be Jews, they, don't, they just don't get it. I'm sure a lot of these people are honest in their hearts. They're, they're just cheerfully ignorant, I guess. And it, it's sad. Do you remember Jesus Christ doing something like this? In Luke chapter 4. Well, go to Isaiah 61 first. Isaiah 61 and it's quoted in Luke 4. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 61, verse 1. And the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now in Luke chapter 4, the first words, recorded words of Jesus Christ, he quotes this passage and he leaves out the last part of it on the day of vengeance. Why? Because the Lord isn't through with the nation of Israel. That's why. We can read about the Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy 29 and Deuteronomy 30. Um, but another question, did Israel ever fully occupy the land that God gave them? Why not? Do you still believe they're going to, that's going to happen? Why do you believe that? Because the Bible tells me so. Just think of the song. In Deuteronomy 20, you don't, you don't have to go there. Um, in fact, why don't you go to Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. Excuse my voice. When I take a certain medication, it makes my voice out hard, worse. Deuteronomy 29. Now, in Deuteronomy 28, don't go there, you have the first 14 verses that talks about blessings for the nation of Israel. That chapter has 68 verses. After verse 15, it's all the curses. So there's a lot more curses than there are blessings. After 40 years in the desert, they spent two years at Kadesh Barnea, 38 years wandering around. Um, as Leviticus said, there's five courses of judgment, and they failed in every way. There's still seven years left on the fifth course of judgment. Look at Deuteronomy 29, verses 26 to 28. Deuteronomy 29, 26. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Am I in the wrong one? I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. My pause. Got to wake up here. Okay, Deuteronomy 29, verse 28. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into the land, another land, as it is this day. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to, unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Look at, go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and let me read you the first six verses here 
um, Israel's Palestinian covenants in light of their failure. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, thou shalt call him to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of, thy, of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven from thence, will the Lord God gather thee? And come from thence, will he fetch thee? And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do to thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Last verse. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul that thou mayest live. Have any of, you, any of you had the question, as far as the millennial kingdom, that when the people who make it, they're, they're given the, the power of the new covenant? What about their children? Verse 6 says it's, that's going to happen to, to their children for the thousand years. Look at Deuteronomy 31 and verse 29. Deuteronomy 31, 29. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Somebody's a little upset there, yeah. right? There are two immutable things regarding God. The Lord's counsel, his word, and the Lord's oath, his promise. Now, you can describe the Bible in four words, faith in the promise. Now, depends on this, what dispensation you're talking about, but that describes the whole Bible, starting from Genesis 3.15, first and second coming. Is his counsel for naught? Is he capable of breaking his oath or promises? You don't have to go there. Exodus 19, 6, he says to Israel, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But Revelation 1, 6 says, and hath made us kings and priests unto the God Father. If people think they are spiritual Israel, why don't you come with me sometimes to the other church in the building and ask them if they're kings or priests? Are you a king? What do you, what do you have power over? Are you, are you, are, are you these, what are you? Are you a priest? The last time the word priest is used in Acts, in, in Acts 26, and then it jumps all the way over to Paul, over Paul, to Hebrews chapter 2. We aren't priests, and we're not kings. So Acts 26, the last time in Acts, jumps all the way over Paul's epistles. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, you don't have to go there. The Lord tells Israel not to mingle with other nations, but they did. But because the Lord loved you, he says in verse 7, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. This is coming out of Egypt now. If you recall the prophecy of Zechariah when he came back and he was able to speak again, he talks about the Lord and says, the oath which he swore unto our father Abraham, and he's going to keep that. You see people in Luke chapter 7, lawyers and Pharisees, they reject the counsel of God. They're there by John the Baptist, and John says, come on here, let's get baptized. They reject the counsel of God. The biggest problem with Israel was their religious pride and their own ego. What did Christ say to the Pharisee that came up when he went and got Matthew, the tax collector, the publican? Israel had a sickness, 
And that sickness is spiritual in nature. They were created by God physically, but they have to be born again. So the only thing spiritual about Israel is that spiritual in nature, they have to be born again as a country. They had the physical birth, but not their spirit, spiritual birth. Now I want you to go to Exodus chapter 33. I'm going to bring up an example, a fellow by the name of Gregory Boyd. I, I, Boyd, I've done it a lot in preaching. He wrote a book called The God of the Possible, published and copyrighted in the year 2000. It's a biblical introduction to the open view of God. What does that mean? That means, in essence, for all good little boys and girls down here, some of those nasty things that are prophesied, he's going to take them away. Now, I'm sure he's a teacher or a preacher. He actually wrote these words down. How far is he from the truth? If we behave ourselves, are you kidding? Maybe me, not you. <laughs> what would that do to our final authority? What would that do to God's integrity? Isaiah 42, 9 says, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Only the true God can do something like that. Now, I had to go to Exodus 33, 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. This is found in Romans chapter 9. God gave himself permission to work outside of his covenants in that verse. If he hadn't given himself permission, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be there. Think about mankind. Was Israel any better than any other Gentile? No. We haven't evolved or morphed into spiritual Israel, as people think. In Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. This kind of nullifies the my nephew, which only the last hundred years that the Bible's relevant to, doesn't it? Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12. I'll just tell you the story for time because i got a lot more to go here. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and Jeroboam was a worker in the house. And they get together, and when Rehoboam became the king, the old guides, the old wise guys that used to know Solomon, he said, I would advise you to treat the people good. Don't put any more upon them because they, they won't stay with you. He says, well, let me think about, about it three days. Three days he comes back. And his counselors, the younger ones, say, stick it to him. What happened? The country split. You had 10 tribes that went north that were taken over by the Assyrians. And then the two tribes south, Judah and Benjamin, that were eventually taken over by Nebuchadnezzar. That was the beginning of the time of the Gentiles right there. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, my nephew was brainwashed with the idea, and he truly believes this, that mankind is not the same at the beginning as, as he is now. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. 
Notice that word sound. It's the Greek word, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right, but hygienino, which means be sound, be sound and be well in good health. We get our word hygiene from this word. The practice of keeping yourself and things around you clean in order to prevent illness and disease. That's why all the women, when companies come over, they'll pull out the vacuum for a couple, they haven't seen in two months, and they'll vacuum up and make it look, we we'll always do it that way, right? This is used, this word is used metaphorically of Christians whose opinions are free from any mixture of error. Wouldn't you want that? Oh, let's go wash up, you know, and, but I, I got no error. But a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. How do you get past that? Here's some of the words that describe sound doctrine, wholesome words, sound words, same word, sound in the faith, sound in faith. Most of us grew up hearing that cleanliness is next to godliness, but you could write out of the Bible. Because Paul says, and such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. The cleansing with the washing of water of the word. You go to that Bible and you, you pour these words through your head and it's got a filter. You keep on pouring it through and it gets clearer and clearer and clearer. And you're never going to know anything, everything. But it's absolutely amazing. If you read, go to Romans chapter 11. Now think about the verse that we just talked about, Exodus 33, 19. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. In Romans chapter 9, did you say 9? Nine? 11, thank you. Just listen to the next few verses. And think of that Exodus one. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. I see Exodus thirty three nineteen in that passage. Setting all people aside, making them all equal, like it was before the Jewish the Jews started. Regarding human humanity, is there any wonder why God would give Himself permission to work outside of His covenants? Why do you think Paul penned Second Corinthians chapter three? You might want to go there. I'm going to read a passage here. Second Corinthians three. Do you know what our message does or did for the nation of Israel? The preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, teaches Israel about her program. They need to be born again. But look what Paul, through the Holy Spirit, calls the law. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the spirit rather be glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more that the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. He says in verse 12, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that Israel couldn't see. So he calls the law of the ministry of condemnation the administration of death. Something better than the law came along. And that was the gospel of grace. Why is the Lord so detailed and careful in his writings? So meticulous. Meticulous. Came in and say the words today. You remember the doctrine that we learned about the genealogy of Mary and Joseph? I mean, these things, if somebody didn't teach them to you, they're kind of hard, you know, to find these things. It's a lot of work. 
Joseph, they both came from Solomon, and Joseph came through a line where you hear about this king, Jeconiah or Kaniah. He did something, and the, and the Lord says, there will never be a king in your line sitting on the throne. Mary came from Nathan, another son of Solomon's. So she had the Lord. There was no intercourse. She, he was the first man born without a sin nature. Now, how many of those charismatics know something like this? They probably need their little barf bags, just, you know, they get so excited, you know, <laughs> hearing stuff like this, jumping up and down, whooping and hollering. Think of the new covenant. Isn't the new covenant going to give the Jews the power to think and act perfectly? Yes. Well, they're, gonna, they're not going to need any teachers, are they? I want you to go to Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel 44. I want to tell you a little story. But something that's going on in the millennial kingdom. Now, before I begin to that, let me read you Ezekiel 45, 17 on my paper here. And it shall be the prince's part to give the burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feast and in the new moons and in the Sabbath in all solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Now, Ezekiel 44, verses 1 to 3. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord thy God of Israel hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince he shall sit, sit in to eat the bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the same way, of the same way. This verse passage is talking about an act of worship. If the Lord entered through a gate, we can come the same way. Now, let me read you verses four through nine. Then he brought then brought he me, then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof. And mark well the entering in of the house, with every going forth of the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread and the fat for the blood. And they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations, and ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? This is the bad thing. What did they do? The Levites had grown weary of temple service and engaged others to discharge the service. It's not good. I thought Sin had consequences. Now think of the people, the new covenant blessing, they're going to walk perfectly. By the way, verse 9 proves we're not spiritual Israel because here physical and spiritual circumcision were necessary. Brother R. Johnson gave me that verse a long time ago. Verse 
Let me read you verses 10 through 14. Ezekiel 44, 10 through 14. I didn't read verse 9, so let me start verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, no stranger uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter my, enter my sanctuary, and if any stranger that is among the children. Now verse 10, 10 through 14. And the Levites that are gone away far from me, that are gone far away from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray, away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet, they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gate of the house and ministering to the house. And they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, have I lifted up mine hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. He's talking about the Levites now. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed, but I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the services thereof and for all that shall be done therein. Now, what you read about in various parts of the Bible, I'm not going to... The Levites as a class shall perform temple service, but they will be barred from priestly duties because of their, last, their, their sins, their past sins. They will be confined to the court of priests and not permitted to enter the palace itself. Such will be their punishment throughout the thousand years. Sin does have consequences. All of this is done to Restore the Aaronic priesthood. Now, I got a bunch of verses here, but I don't have enough time to do it. But you'll see that um, Zadok, the king, he was a high priest. He was, a, he was one of the priests, and he came through Eleazar, the son of Aaron. And then there was another priest called Abaviathar. He was in the lineage of Ithamar, the youngest son of Aaron. And the king Saul massacred the village, at not, not the whole village, and only Abiathar was the one who, who ran away, was safe. When, they met, when he met David, they, they, they bonded, and then they were told, David told them to do the priestly work. Now, that's when Absalom comes along, and what happens with Absalom? He wants to take position, the power. That didn't happen. And both Zadok and Abiathar Help David with that. They say it on David's side. But David had another son called Adonijah that tried the same thing. This time, only Zadok stayed with David. And Abiathar went with them. So, you know, these verses are in 1 Kings 22, 1 Samuel. I mean, all these verses. And it, you know, weaves around like that. But you come out with a piece of fruit, with a treasure, the little nugget of knowledge that you might have not have known. Then you think, okay, the new covenant. He's not lying. They're going to be doing service, just not the service they were supposed to do because of their past transgressions. Why does this, this isn't easy to do, is it? Why did God make it so hard? To separate from the wheat from the tares? In a manner of speaking. Well, what does Paul say about? He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power of God may be of God, not of us. If you would, please go to 2 Peter chapter 3 once again. 2 Peter 3. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. I looked up this word, slack. And one of the words to describe it was to loiter. When I was growing up, I remember cops could get, give tickets for, being, for loitering. Do they still do that? I'm too old, I don't loiter anymore, you know, but you know, I don't get any tickets. Right. To loiter. Did that word ever come to mind when you thought of God? Ever. Delay? Hesitate? Now again, I'm talking about spiritual Israel. Think what they do to the last 2,000 years. Has God been loitering? Or has he been offering salvation as a free gift? 2,000 years almost. You talk about long-suffering, that's different than loitering. Loitering, you're up to no good. A cop saw you loitering, he's got you guilty before you're pronounced innocent, and you probably were guilty. Has some other words to delay, lazy, foolish, careless, vanity, ineffectually. You're talking about the God of the universe? Did you ever hear, the, you've heard it, an idle mind is the devil's workshop? Do any of these words describe the Lord Jesus Christ or God Almighty? In 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 and 16, Paul says, In account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. I always say this about this. There's going to be people quoting verses on their way to hell. They didn't rest with the truth. They forgot the 2,000 years of, of, of mercy for the world. I mean, he stopped Israel's time clock, didn't he? More than once. There was one 490-year period that took over 600 years to fulfill because they were under bondage. The Lord let him be in the bondage. But a Jew doesn't understand. They always only think of physical salvation. They don't understand spiritual salvation, that they need it, that everybody needs it, just physical. We have the ministration of the Spirit. We have the gospel of the grace of God. And this gospel is going to read men's hearts. It's going to tell them what they really think and believe at the judgment seat. Think of Israel's history. And think of their relationship with God, with their God. Now, I'm going to go down. I'm going to say a verse. I'm going to read it. Just write down a verse, okay? I have to get through this. Think of their history with, Israel, with, their, with God. So, Ephesians 1.18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is, it hope, what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. No, Paul, no enlightenment. Ephesians 3.16, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. No, Paul, you don't understand anything about the inner man because you're looking at the outer man. How many sounds can I make? How many people can I impress? 2 Timothy 3.10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. No, Paul, your doctrine is not fully known. Period. 1 Timothy 2, 2 through 4, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. No, Paul, no full knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 1, 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first 
Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. No fall, no Paul, you will follow the wrong pattern. You're going to make up your own. And that's what everybody you see out there in the radio and TV that's charismatic, Pentecostal. Thinking the church started in Acts chapter 2. I've told this a lot of times, but we've, we've been on the phones a couple of decades, and when people think the church today, when I ask them, there's more than one church in the Bible, they're going, no, just one. Well, when did it start? Acts 2. I offer them $10,000 on the spot if they can show me anywhere in Acts 1 through 7 where it talks about Gentiles. And I'm cheap. You know, I'm not going to pay that. I know that, Dr. I tell people, if you're not sure of it, just say, this is my current level of understanding. But I understand this one. So I ain't going to get rid of $10,000. 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies to which went on before thee, before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. No, Paul? You don't even know such a thing. You don't know there's a good fight, and it's called a good warfare. You don't know that because you're still focused on what you're doing or what you think you're doing and showing other people. It's sad. I'm not angry. I just get excited. He says, 612, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, wherein thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. No, Paul, you're in the wrong place. Fight. First Timothy 6.12, I mean, Ephesians 6.17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. No, Paul? You don't know how to handle your weapon. You don't even see it as a weapon. Why is it a weapon? Because Job 40.19 says, Talking about Satan, he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make a sword to approach unto him. You know what the word approach means? Draw near. When you have a sword, you got to get near the person. You can't be off, you know, with a scope and a rifle. Too. You come near the person. We fight spiritual wickedness in high places. It's the prince and power of the air. You want to have the sword sharp so you can stick him when you need to. And the only thing that you can stick him with is the truth. And those people don't have the truth. They're going around with their holy vomit bags and all this stuff bouncing up and down, saying all these things, getting all this money. Ain't going to do them no good. You can't take it with you. You can put them in the coffin, the money paid, but they're just going to rot like your bodies. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Have to teach. Patient. And meek is instructive of those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. No rightly dividing Paul's epistles. You have fallen into the snare of the devil. A few more seconds here. 2 Timothy 1.6 Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hand. The stir, it says to kindle or keep in full flame. Is your will strong enough? Is your blade sharp enough to stand the good, for, good warfare and a good fight? Dear Lord, once again, thank you for this time and so much for what your son did for us. I usually don't have words to think about that, but say about that, but it's, it's beyond words. But I just thank you for what your son did. And what he's offering for the last 2,000 years, salvation is a free gift. Amen.